Good afternoon. Today is the February 4th, 2016 meeting. I will note for all in attendance that today's meeting is being live streamed on the uh, NCPC website. We do have a quorum, so we'll uh, proceed uh, without objection to the agenda as has been publicly uh, noticed. Um, agenda item number one is the report of the chairman. I don't have a significant report, but I'll note that Courtney Allen from the Senate Committee on Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs is sitting in today for Chairman Johnson's uh, alternate. Welcome, Ms. Allen. Welcome back, Ms. Allen. Uh, agenda item number two is a report of the executive director, Mr. Acosta. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I only have two items to report on. Uh, there's a Section 106 consulting party meeting uh, for the Smithsonian National Air and Space uh, Project on February 22nd, 10 a.m. at the NCPC offices. The public is welcome to attend, and you'll find more information on our website. And finally, I'd like to extend our thanks to our staff uh, for generously contributing to the federal government's combined federal um, campaign in support of individuals and communities in need. The agency received the CFC Chairman's Award in recognition of their efforts. So thanks to Urban Planner Nick uh, Bernard for coordinating the agency's campaign. Uh, you do have a written report. I'd be happy to answer any questions. <coughs> Any questions for Ms. Acosta? Hearing none. Uh, agenda item number three is the legislative update. Ms. Schuyler is away today, so we will proceed on. Um, and agenda item number four is the consent calendar. There's one item on it. And um, I have a just a quick question. Um, I noticed on the front sheet it says preliminary approval of site and building plans, but it's actually preliminary and final. Is that correct? Preliminary and final. And my second question is um, the preliminary and final plans are before us, but the project is well under, cons under construction. Is that is there a story there? <laughs> Mr. Weil? <laughs> I mean, wayward carts and horses, I think. But, uh, <laughs> they were they were a little late in, in submitting it to us. I, I guess we just got overlooked. Um, and uh, really, the only the only reason why uh, it, it the, the district government should be you know as a, a normal regular course of action referring projects uh, to our commission for review. However, um, on this one, I you know it went through a lot of different. Uh, hurdles, but uh, we we got overlooked, and uh, they realized their mistake afterwards, and we contacted them, and they were sure. able to submit it uh, to us. So, okay, thank you very much. Um, any questions on the any additional questions on the consent calendar? The one item. Uh, hearing none, is there a motion on the consent calendar? So it's been moved and seconded. All in favor of the one item on the consent calendar, say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Thank you. Agenda item number 5A is the final site and building plans for the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau headquarters. And Mr. Hart, welcome. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission. The General Services Administration is submitting uh, the final site and building plans for the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau headquarters modernization project. The Commission approved the preliminary design back in February of 2014. Since that time, CFPB, as it is known, has entered into an agreement with GSA for it to manage the development and construction of the CFPB headquarters uh, building project. GSA is proposing uh, a few changes as part of the final design, uh, and I will be describing these uh, in this presentation. As a refresher, the uh, site is located between um, G and F Streets. It's uh, north of F Street, south of G Street, and then west of 17th Street. It's also west of the uh, Eisenhower Executive Office Building and northwest of the uh, historic Winder Building. The Winder Building uh, it actually dates back uh, pre-Civil War and has housed a variety of federal offices since that time. The site was the location of the uh, historic Riggs National Bank, which you see uh, pictured here. GSA demolished this bank in 1974. This image is looking uh, at the Riggs Bank from the corner of um, G Streets and 17th Street. Historic preservation plays an important role in, this, uh, in, in the project that's before you. Uh, given that the former Riggs National Bank uh, and the CFP CFPB headquarters building have both um, been found to be historic uh, uh, buildings. 
interpretation uh, of architectural elements that were salvaged from the Riggs uh, Bank building facade will be placed on display as part of this project. So um, here's an image of the same corner from G and 17th Streets. It shows the, um, the building now referred to as the CFPB headquarters. It is uh, a 400,000 square foot building constructed in 1977. Uh, and in, at that time, it was the headquarters for a, uh, the Federal Home Loan Bank Board. It was part of a, um, the building was part of a GSA's Living Buildings Program, uh, and that was a new breed of uh, federal buildings that attempted to engage and contribute to the surrounding community. The building, designed by noted uh, architect uh, Max Urban, uh, the building that you see here, is a modern architectural style. It represents a transition between, uh, from brutalist architecture to uh, what's known as contextualism. Uh, contextualism uh, really means uh, buildings that, will, that were designed to be sympathetic with its surrounding context. And in this case, um, as you can see here, it um, mimics um, some of the uh, architectural uh, elements uh, in the Winder building to, its, uh, to, the, to the south of it, as in the, the height and then uh, in coloration as well. I'll also note that the uh, exposed structure uh, of the building, the, um, you note the columns and then the, uh, the concrete floor slabs, uh, they play an integral role in the, uh, in the facade and are, and are designated as character-defining features um, uh, uh, as part of the Section 106 uh, process. So when this building was constructed, uh, it was um, it incorporated a few new idea, ideas, um, and the plan here is just to, uh, to show them. Uh, first is uh, ground floor retail. Uh, there aren't many buildings that have ground floor retail that are federal buildings. Um, and there's also the Liberty Plaza, uh, this is a publicly accessible plaza, originally intended to uh, double as a ice rink uh, in the winter. So um, the next two slides are some images um, of the existing building. Um, the first image is a, uh, the storefronts, the retail uh, along G Street, um, the corner of G and 17th Street, uh, the lobby of the uh, CFPB headquarters, and then um, this is actually an entrance to the, uh, the plaza from 17th Street. Uh, here are a few other images. Um, the, f the top image actually shows the uh, a breezeway uh, and then the uh, Liberty Plaza, which is um, at the end of this breezeway. And then you see Liberty Plaza itself uh, taken from a, a few vantage points. Um, as was the case with the preliminary review, GSA is maintaining that uh, the retail uses, uh, as well as revitalizing Liberty Plaza as part of uh, their um, modernization project. I'll note that CFA is very, uh, excuse me, that NCPC is very uh, supportive of GSA's effort to maintain the retail uses uh, in federal buildings and to provide public access to federal plazas and parks that are located in dense urban areas. So um, in an effort to uh, save uh, some time, uh, I've integrated the proposal with the staff analysis. This uh, slide describes uh, what I'll be focusing on, uh, focusing on during the uh, remainder of this presentation. Um, uh, first, I'll be describing how GSA is addressing the main comment uh, during the uh, preliminary review, which was really focused around um, uh, perimeter security. After that, I'll describe the changes uh, in, the, in the proposal between the preliminary and final design. Uh, and GSA is proposing um, the changes that you see here, which are reinforcing the first floor columns, uh, simplifying the design for Liberty Plaza, relocating the children's play area uh, from the roof to the ground floor, and finally interpreting the Riggs Bank uh, elements. And in general, uh, we're very supportive of the changes as they are helping to create a, a seamless overall design, which uh, simultaneously helps to protect the historic nature of the building as well as just, uh, its surrounding area. So uh, this is a, a plan of the uh, preliminary design. The commission requested that uh, the CFPB explore ways to reduce the number of, of bollards um, around, uh, as well as move them out of the public right-of-way in an effort to reduce impacts to pedestrian movements. And this is the, uh, the final design. Um, GSA was able to remove uh, a number of bollards uh, from the design um, and the bollards themselves, they're kind of circled here. Um, they're at the, uh, the breezeway entrances here and here along G Street. Uh, there were three that were at the uh, center, the, uh, the uh, lobby entrance. 
Uh, and then there were uh, several that were uh, into the entrances to the uh, to Liberty Plaza here on 17th Street, as well as uh, on F Street. So here are a few images um, that show the perimeter security uh, around the site. Um, the Liberty Plaza entrance from F Street, uh, the Liberty Plaza entrance from 17th Street, as well as the um, building entrance. Um, this is the uh, entrance with the uh, bollards here in the bottom right-hand uh, image. After reviewing the plans and written narrative, um, staff is satisfied the GSA has placed uh, all bollards either at the property line out of the public right-of-way or in locations that minimize their impact on pedestrian movements around the building. So um, now we get to the um, changes that GSA has included in the final design. Uh, GSA determined that it needed to reinforce the columns on the ground floor against bending and shear forces. As I noted earlier, the columns are important character-defining elements of the facade for historic preservation purposes. Although this reinforcement is only necessary for the, um, the ground floor columns, and there are 39 of those columns, um, as you can see here, any change um, in the ground floor um, columns could adversely affect the historic fabric of the building, as some of these columns are expressed not only on the, on the ground floor, but on multiple floors, as you see in these columns here. GSA developed a number of options to reinforce the columns as part of the uh, agency consultation meetings it held in 2005, excuse me, 2015, as well as earlier this year. Uh, after consultation, GSA is now proposing to add a thin fiber reinforced polymer to the column exterior. GSA states uh, that uh, an artisan will then cover, uh, with, cover that column uh, with an epoxy that matches the color of the ex existing concrete and at the same time will add uh, concrete form markings um, uh, uh, to that mimic the existing columns. And you can see some of the markings here. They're kind of uh, a spiral um, line that goes around the column um, and uh, to the top. And so they're, they'd be mar mimicking those in the, uh, in the column, uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the newer columns. GSA created a, an on-site mock-up that you see here in this image in the center. Um, and after um, reviewing this uh, mock-up, uh, NCPC staff as well as CFA staff and the uh, district um, st state historic preservation officer um, all agree that this is acceptable because it will provide a necessary reinforcement and closely approximate the uh, existing column condition. The next design change uh, GSA is proposing uh, is to uh, Liberty Plaza uh, and the layout of it. As you can see in the comparison, the final site uh, plan is a, a simpler design that helps to uh, define the space uh, better. This is a closer look at, uh, at the final site plan. Um, and included in this, this plan are um, kind of groups of trees uh, to the center or west, as well as uh, some that are a uh, linear pattern um, near the uh, 17th Street entrance. Uh, fountains, both on the eastern and western uh, side of the plaza, a sunken garden, as well as uh, what they're referring to as a porch, um, which will be parallel to uh, the Winder building to the uh, south of the plaza. <coughs> this is a perspective rendering to show the differences um, between the uh, uh, preliminary and final design. The uh, preliminary design included many different materials and spaces, and these seem to be um, in competition with, with each other. The current proposal removes um, some elements um, there, was a, there was a water table, uh, this element here, as well as um, some understory uh, shrubs, um, some uh, um, plants that were, be, that were growing on the, uh, on the porch um, element, as well as this glass uh, uh, enclosure around the, uh, the sunken garden, and replace them, replace them with um, the elements that you see here on the, uh, the right-hand image. <coughs> And in its place, really, GSA is trying to create a, a, a space where federal employees could uh, perhaps enjoy a lunch, um, or you could have uh, people that are, are uh, visitors to the city be able to um, have a, a brief uh, respite. Uh, and a few other images. Um, this is underneath the, uh, the, the tree grouping, the copse of trees. Um, GSA is looking to possibly have uh, some 
uh, movable chairs and tables underneath here for people to sit and, and enjoy. Um, and you see here the, uh, the porch area. Um, again, uh, a place to be able to possibly read a book, the newspaper, or just do some uh, kind of people watching. Uh, some additional detail on the uh, sunken garden. Um, its main purpose really is to allow light into the uh, below grade workspaces um, down here, as well as provide a vent for the um, below grade parking garage, um, which you see the vent grill here. Um, so the walls would be up, there's a fountain at, at an end, and a, uh, a, a shallow uh, pool at the, uh, the bottom of this. The material plaza, palette for the plaza um, shown uh, in this image. Uh, their uh, limestone would be used for the, uh, to cap the seating areas as well as around the, the sunken garden. Uh, uh, granite uh, used for the, uh, the fountain areas. Decomposed granite pavement um, for the, uh, the, the tree grouping in the middle of the, uh, of the, of the plaza. Pre-weathered cedar planks used for the, the porch. And then brick pavers uh, throughout the, uh, the site um, and really, uh, if you notice, if you re recall from the existing image, um, these uh, brick pavers are actually already um, used on the, uh, throughout the plaza uh, today. So here we have the plant materials uh, for the plaza as well. Um, they include both uh, shrubs and ground cover as well as trees. Um, the shrubs and ground cover include um, uh, red twig um, dogwoods, uh, Siberian carpet cypress as well as winter jasmine. And the trees on the bottom you see are uh, honey locust and uh, ginkgos. Uh, staff is, and I should note that staff is supportive of the changes for the uh, plaza. Um, uh, and this is because um, uh, with the removal of these elements, it's now more of a unified, sustainable design that um, uh, has pieces that, that complement each other well. Sorry. The next change uh, GSA is proposing is to move the playground, um, which was um, in, the pre in the preliminary des design located on the roof. And uh, this is now moving this playground to the ground floor. You see it here. Um, that rooftop um, playground would have required uh, a new uh, elevator um, as well as, uh, not a new one, but a, uh, extending the elevator to the, the top floor as well as stairwell uh, and would have required a solid uh, wall that was eight feet in height um, to enclose the entire uh, play area. Moving the play area to the ground means that none of those um, uh, of those changes would be necessary. And um, we find this this location is uh, is acceptable because it will be close to the child development center, and you see here outlined here in very close proximity, actually uh, connecting to it. Um, it won't really uh, take any portion of Liberty Plaza, and it uh, won't require the addition on the, uh, on, the, on the roof of the building. Finally, GSA is also proposing um, the uh, location uh, for the Riggs Bank elements. These architectural elements include um, four medallions. You see an image of the medallion here, as well as uh, 11 other building elements uh, that include the uh, keystone, as well as um, capitals for, the, uh, for several of the columns on the exterior of the building. Um, these were preserved um, after the building uh, was uh, demolished. Um, the interpretation of these elements is a stipulation that was included in the Memorandum of, of Agreement um, for Section 106 uh, purposes. GSA is, uh, has, um, uh, through consultation, GSA has um, located uh, two areas for displaying these elements. Um, the first uh, location is the East Breezeway for the medallions. Um, and then the, uh, the other location is the, um, the West Breezeway for the uh, building elements. And GSA did look at a number of um, different layouts and, and locations and finally um, um, uh, landed on, on that location uh, again after um, uh, considerable, considerable uh, consultation for, the, uh, for those, uh, those elements. Um, what you see here are the uh, Riggs Bank elements, the uh, 11 um, uh, elements that will be displayed in a linear fashion. Uh, there is one uh, interpretive plaque that will be it's located here um, that will be included uh, in this uh, interpretation uh, element as well as on the eastern 
uh, breezeway as well. And this uh, plaque will have information uh, pertaining to the, um, uh, the Riggs Bank uh, itself. And here we have the locations for the, the four medallions. Um, there will be two on, on each wall, um, again with uh, interpretive plaques. Um, uh, uh, located underneath them. These, uh, the information from the interpretive plaques hasn't been um, fully uh, determined as of yet. Um, after consultation about uh, these elements, um, uh, NCPC staff as well as the CFA and the State Historic Preservation Office uh, found that the two breeze breezeways were the best locations because they were covered areas and made most um, uh, use of several existing blank walls where the elements could be um, properly displayed. And with that, um, the executive director's recommendation is that the commission approve the final site and building plans for the modernization of the um, CFPB headquarters. Note that the that GSA is submitting the project for final approval with the following changes that are sh uh, shown here. Support the uh, proposed column reinforcement approach that will add uh, approximately 2.75 inches to the current column width, um, maintain the existing, the character defining features of the columns, and not adversely affect the historic facade. And finally, commend both CFPB as well as GSA on the project, which um, moderni modernizes an existing fa uh, facility, minimizes the impacts to the historic fabric. Uh, provides services for employees, combines public and private uses, and finally uh, encourages pedestrian accessibility around and through the facility. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Hart, very much. Um, it's an important project, a long time in the making. Uh, Mr. May? Uh, so it's, it's a little hard to remember exactly what was in the project last time around, but I remember there were some things in it that didn't really sit very well, uh, and I think that this is a significantly improved project, so I'm pleased with where it has uh, landed. Um, I do have one question, which has to do with the, uh, the your mention of the bollards essentially going away. Is that when They didn't go away. They're, st they're still there. It's just that they've um, removed, they've uh, 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 reduced the number of bollards that, that, were, uh, that were proposed in the preliminary uh, design. So they're still there. It's just that they were. And then this, essentially in the same location? Um, yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, but so they're reduced in number. Yes. Okay, so I, I thought it was. No, no, they, they're, they're still there. They, they just had to um, kind of figure out what the, spa the correct spacing right. was. Yeah, okay. Um, no, that's it. I think it's looks great. Thanks. Ms. White? I, I had the same sort of what was in there before <laughs> question. I just have two. On, Particularly on this slide, can you go back to the slide where you showed the existing condition of that area? Sorry. The, my question is just trying to remember the discussion around why on one side you have stairs or steps and on the other the oh. ramp. Um, and maybe it's because of the curve of the building. You couldn't have a ramp on both sides. I'm just thinking if someone's in a wheelchair and it's raining, they have to go out and around to get to the entrance there a, to the there's actually there's, there's actually a ramp that's right here. Yeah, I see the ramp on the left, but on the right. This there, is actually a, an entrance to the um, to the building, to the right. actual the, the lobby. It's at that it's level, at that so level. you can't do a ramp because of the slope. I just was Why? trying to remember the discussion around it. I know we. Well, it's also, that's you know, right. it's a, it's a, um, eligible for the historic register, and so we're, we're trying to leave as much intact as we possibly can. And this is really the, this is the existing condition now. Okay, that's, that's what I wanted yeah. to remember Actually, if that yeah. was the case, because I think it's, I think it's a, a lovely change. It just struck me in the <laughs> material. Yeah, it's hard to see in this image, yeah. but this, there are stairs on, on that side of, there's, an, there's a light well, I guess they call it, that's, uh, that's at the 17th Street entrance. Um, and on the other side of that, between the, the stairs or the well, light well in the building, there are stairs that, that, that go up. And there's actually a ramp there as well uh, on, the, on the side, the, exactly the way that it is now. Right. I just didn't get a chance to get over there to see it. And then I had just one quick question, and I noticed in the preliminary there was a a living green wall, but that's no longer in the plan. Am I right? Did I just miss that? And it was probably because of the way you did the configuration with the fountain? Because I thought that was a nice idea, but maybe when you actually go to implement it, you just couldn't do it. So I was just curious 
how that decision came about to eliminate it? I think it was a combination of factors, but when we, I think the, the prevailing thought myself included was that the original design just had too much happening. There were too many different ideas going on and uh, there was a, 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 the small problem that a lot of what was um, in the original design was uh, would not really grow and be um, um, the beautiful the array the that was rendered <laughs> in the original design. Okay, thanks. I just didn't have time to go back and look at it. Makes sense. Thank you. Other comments or questions? Ms. Wright, you have anything else to add? You've been with this project a long time? Um, um, I'm just, no, I don't have anything to add other than as um, I, the, the plaza um, used to be a vital, wonderful place back in the 80s. Um, and it's the one time we don't have to look at the Park Service and blame them for not maintaining <laughs> Mr. May. So, 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 so you should love this. Um, and, and it's a, it's a, it's been a huge opportunity to bring back a public space for, for, um, that what we hope will be generations of, um, an active, um, lovely space for everyone to enjoy. So I'm thrilled with this project. Um, I, I'm, I couldn't be more pleased with the final result. And I'm just jabbing you. <laughs> I was thrilled about it too until a minute ago. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, um, <laughs> on that note, Ms. Wright, do you have a motion? I do have a motion. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded, uh, sensing no additional comment or question. All in favor of the EDR before you say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Hart. <laughs> Agenda. It was a backhanded compliment. <laughs> <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't feel like one? <laughs> Agenda item 5B is the final master plan for the Marine Corps Base Quantico. Mr. Weil is here. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission. This is a, a final master plan review submission uh, by the Marine Corps Base Quantico, which is located in Quantico, Virginia. Uh, the Commission reviewed the draft master plan and issued a number of recommendations and comments uh, back in July of uh, last year, 2015. So the installation encompasses a, a total of 58,000 acres located 35 miles south of Washington, D.C. and 20 miles north of Fredericksburg, Virginia. Uh, as you can see by the map, the installation is bifurcated by uh, the Route 1 I-95 corridor. Uh, separated into two sections. Uh, the portion to the west of I-95 is known as West Side. The portion uh, located in between the Potomac River and Route 1 is known as Main Side. Uh, west Side is largely undeveloped and used as uh, training rangeland, uh, and a vast majority of the, the population on the installation and tenants reside on the Main Side. So this is the master plan vision statement and a number of master plan goals that support that vision statement. Uh, these have not changed since the draft master plan. Um, and all of these goals in the vision statement may be summarized by uh, protecting the installation's mission as a training, educational, and live fire base, retaining the installation's many historic fe features and historic character, improving the quality of life for military personnel and their families, and creating a more environmentally sustainable installation. So this is the final master plan. Uh, it's divided into three sections, an existing conditions section and two uh, future plan sections. Uh, again, this is the same organization uh, that, that was in the draft, uh, the draft master plan document. Uh, in terms of the uh, two future plan components, uh, there's a short range that looks uh, out a couple of years to 2018 and a long range 20-year uh, component. Uh, each of these future sections have a land use plan. 
a framework plan that that um, uh, that divides the installation into a number of smaller planning districts, a number of regulating and illustrative plans uh, that that apply to these smaller planning districts, a circulation plan, and a parks and uh, open space plan. So the draft master plan. Uh, consisted of three separate documents, a draft master plan, a transportation management plan, and a bicycle and pedestrian mobility plan. So during NCPC's draft master plan review last summer, commission recommendations focused on the four broad uh, categories uh, shown before you on the slide, including removing impervious surface areas, especially along the waterfront, consolidating the many surface lots into fewer parking garages, improving the urban design within the downtown Barnett Avenue district, and improving the pedestrian bicycle uh, and transit accessibility throughout the installation. So the final master plan submission includes uh, the three revised documents, and in addition, uh, a master plan addendum. And um, the final master plan addendum uh, revises the long-term framework plan component, which consists of uh, a revised set of illustrative plan graphics and a supporting memorandum that spells out the specific changes to the Chapter 7 uh, long-range plan text, as well as graphics that identify uh, future small area planning districts, uh, which I will discuss later on in my presentation. And this is how Quantico will consider and potentially implement the Commission's draft uh, master plan recommendations. So the, the significant part of the addendum that I want to draw your attention to are these amended illustrative uh, long-term plans which are used to reflect uh, our draft master plan recommendations. So for example, starting with the Marine Corps University District, uh, during our, um, our uh, draft master plan review, the commission identified several surface parking lots near the waterfront as potential opportunities for parking removal. And this revised master plan graphic, which is included in the addendum, shows this as an overlay area that has potential for impervious surface reduction and a resulting parking consolidation. In the next long range uh, graphic for Barnett Avenue, which functions as the installation's downtown uh, area, NCPC previously noted several areas for parking consolidation future traffic calming and streetscape improvements, and an opportunity for redesigning a roadway for pedestrian bicycle only use. Uh, and th these are reflected in the master plan addendum graphic uh, shown up here on this slide. The headquarters district is shown with several potential parking consolidation slash impervious uh, surface removal areas, as well as a potential slip ramp removal and a segment of roadway that could have uh, an improved streetscape. And again, these are all reflective of our uh, previous uh, draft master plan comments. Uh, here's another small area planning district known as Hospital Point. Uh, again, uh, the commission made several uh, draft master plan uh, recommendations, including uh, looking at some impervious surface area removal in the southern part of the district and removing a potential roadway close to the waterfront uh, that, that did not have any identified future development uh, along the roadway. And the final master plan addendum includes a, a revised uh, graphic that shows that uh, Quantico will uh, uh, try to uh, implement those recommendations uh, in the near future. Chamberlain Village, again, this is another small area planning district in this master plan. Uh, the, the commission identified a number of opportunities for potential parking consolidation and an opportunity for potential roadway removal. And uh, this is the master plan addendum graphic that shows uh, uh, Quantico's um, pledge to uh, look at these uh, improvements in the future. And lastly, here's the museum district. Uh, when, when the commission reviewed the draft master plan, uh, we noted a potential area for uh, park it, uh, parking removal uh, and an opportunity to improve a pedestrian connection uh, between a future hotel and the museum building. And uh, this is the final master plan addendum graphic that reflects uh, these comments. 
So regarding next steps with the master plan, this master plan will be supplemented through a series of area development plans, which will be developed over the next two years, between 2016 and 2018. And this is in compliance with the new 2012 UFC installation master planning policies. The framework planning districts, which show future project locations in this master plan, will be consolidated into area development planning districts to plan these areas in more detail. Uh, and, and these use the, these reflect the Commission's previous guidance from our draft master plan review. Uh, and then these subsequent ADPs will be submitted for future review by uh, NCPC. So uh, this graphic is included in the master plan addendum. This shows the main side portion of Quantico uh, divided into a number of uh, future area development planning districts. And this graphic is from this current master plan uh, showing the west side. And again, uh, this portion of the installation will be divided into two uh, area development planning districts for future review by uh, NCPC. So with that, it is the Executive Director's recommendation to the Commission to approve the final 2015 Marine Corps-based Quantico Master Plan update. To note that the final submission includes an addendum that revises the, uh, the final Master Plans Chapter 7, which references uh, future long-term development. Uh, in response to NCPC's draft Master Plan comments uh, related to impervious surface removal, parking consolidation, urban design quality, and pedestrian and bicycle accessibility. And to note that Quantico will develop more refined uh, area development plans between 2016 and 2018, and that Quantico will include uh, NCPC in their uh, planning development process. Uh, and that concludes my presentation. Uh, I believe we also have representation here from Quantico as well, uh, and we're both available to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weil. Questions? I have one. I know that there's going to, in terms of climate adaptation, I know there's ongoing work and additional work to be incorporated uh, later. To what extent, I mean, there's a lot of historic infrastructure very near the water. To what extent has this dominated a discussion among staff, especially in the downtown area, um, university district, et cetera? That, that, Is this part of the river title? The, 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 the title area of yeah, the is river? This, is this part of the Potomac River title? Yes, yeah. yes. Um, I do know that the Marine Corps University District is located um, pretty high up from the, the surface level of the Potomac River. Um, there's, there's kind of a, 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 I would say, a six to ten foot ledge there, um, which I think will uh, help that portion of the installation uh, you know, it'll protect it somewhat from, from rising, potential rising water levels. Uh, I do know that Quantico uh, considers its, you know, many historic assets whenever they, they do some planning. Uh, as to how that relates to uh, future climate adaptation, I unfortunately I don't know in, in great detail how uh, they're going to marry those two uh, areas. However, I, I do know that through this, um, this further small area planning process, they're going to look at each of the districts in much more detail. So I think they will, you know, continue that process. Thank you. Other questions? Ms. White? I just had a general comment about um, the Department of Defense and commending the department for your leadership in climate adaptation and helping elevate the whole discussion so people are thinking about this. So I, I really appreciate the leadership in that regard. Is there a motion on the EDR? Mr. Rhodes moves and Mr. May seconds uh, the EDR. It's before you. Uh, all in favor of the EDR say aye. Opposed, no. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wild. Yeah. Yeah. Pass through on the train all the time, going through. Yeah. Agenda item 5C is the final, final adoption of the federal elements of the comprehensive plan for the national capital region. 
Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission. I'm here to present the updated 2016 federal elements of the Comprehensive Plan for the National Capital. Um, there is one correction that we're providing you today, and um, that's document 05C, which is provided in front of you today. And I'll note that this later in my presentation as we discuss the urban design element. The Comprehensive Plan is a document that guides planning and development in Washington, D.C. and the surrounding region. It consists of two parts, the district elements prepared by the D.C. Office of Planning. And this um, addresses traditional city planning issues such as land use, housing, and economic development. Um, in the early 2016, the D.C. Office of Planning will launch their second amendment cycle of the district elements of the 2006 Comprehensive Plan. Um, and the federal elements prepared by NCPC, this provides a policy framework for the federal government in managing its operations and activities in the national capital region. The federal elements are the blueprint for the long-term development of the national capital um, and are the decision-making framework for the commission actions on plans and proposals submitted for your review. The commission adopted the last federal elements back in 2004. Uh, since 2010, NCPC staff has been bringing individual elements forward for your review as an overall efforts to update the entire federal elements. The eight federal elements consist of urban design. This is new to the comprehensive plan. It includes a technical addendum, the federal workplace, the foreign missions and international organizations, transportation, parks and open space, the federal environment, historic preservation, and visitors and commemoration. Please note that the parks and open space element is not included in this update. And following the completion of the small park study currently being prepared by NCPC and the National Park Service, uh, NCPC will update and submit the element to the commission as a separate amendment. The 2004 parks and open space element policies will remain in effect until updated. In October 1st of 2015, the commission released the draft federal elements for a 60-day public comment period. Uh, the draft federal elements were accessible on our website. We did provide a public comment portal for the public to provide comments. Uh, we'd like to thank everybody that participated during the public comment period. We did receive a number of public comments representing federal and local government agencies, uh, private organizations, and also from individuals. Since 2010, we have received over 460 comments on the federal elements. The public provided comments on each element, including the introduction and the action plan. Um, some of the reoccurring themes that we heard from the comments included accessibility, uh, the environment, urban design, historic preservation, uh, local and regional coordination, and references to acts, executive orders, and existing reports and plans. For a full list of public comments and staff responses, please take a look at Appendix 4 of your EDR. Since the public comment period, NCPC staff has been revising the federal elements to include public input, um, guidance from stakeholder agencies, and also clarifying revisions to the narrative and policies. Um, in the next couple of slides, I will be highlighting the big changes to each document included in the 2016 federal elements. Uh, please note a full list of policies are summarized in Appendix 2. And also, all policy changes since the draft federal elements are included in Appendix 3. The introduction generally uh, remains the same with few changes to the narrative, um, updating information about the district elements and also incorporating reference to the Height of Buildings Act. Uh, the introduction consists of mostly graphic and formatting changes. As noted in your corrected report that was provided to you today, um, after consultation with the D.C. Office of Planning and CPC staff modified policy UDB13 in the urban design element to clarify NCPC's role in reviewing projects relative to the Hyde Act. The modified policy states that the federal government should preserve Washington's picturesque horizontal character and reinforce the Hyde Act, and which accurately expresses the policy direction as intended in this element. Please note this correction for Appendix 2 and 3 of the EDR. 
Overall, the urban design element and technical addendum includes minor changes to the narrative. Um, all action items previously identified in the urban design element have been moved to the action plan. And two new policies were added to the urban design element addressing um, the importance of accessibility, um, which we heard from public comments. One policy addresses the importance of accessibility to and along waterfronts um, and preserving those views from public lands. While the second policy addresses the importance of integrating the accessibility of multiple travel modes, um, the Americans with Disabilities Act, Architectural Barriers Act, um, with the urban design of federal facilities. The federal workplace element includes minor revisions to the narrative to address the different drivers um, that are shaping the federal workplace. Responding to comments on the accessibility of federal buildings to and from surrounding streets and transit facilities, um, we have modified a few of the existing policies. In response to comments on the federal government's reducing footprint, uh, we've added one new policy to evaluate the efficiency of existing facilities. Um, this policy will help anticipate the future use and reuse of federal space and land. The foreign missions and international organization element generally remains the same. Uh, we consolidated multiple sections regarding the proposed foreign mission center um, and moved into one location under section A, policies related to chancery development. And also in response to comments regarding the addition of green space and tree canopies, uh, the protection of parks and open space, and the consideration of vehicular access of events, we have modified some of the existing policies. The update to the transportation element includes rearranging the orders of section A, B, C, and D. Um, this is to address one of the public comments as well as to better connect how multiple sections relate to one another. Um, in response to comments on the existing transit network and bicycle and pedestrian access, uh, commuter rails, capital bike share, um, and the safety of multi-use trails, we have modified a few of the existing policies. <coughs> Two new policies were added to this element to address improve accessibility of the regional transit system and the need for greater coordination of federal private shuttles and circulators with local transit station owners. NCPC received multiple comments regarding the natural and physical environment, um, which resulted in changes to the narrative um, and modified policies in the environment element. The element includes new narrative addressing um, ecosystem services, shorelines, the protection of wetlands, the Chesapeake Bay program, the Anacostia Water Initiative, and the impacts of light pollution on the Naval Observatory. And in response to comments, um, we have added three new policies to this element. One considers the critical services and infrastructure reliability when addressing climate change and plans and projects. Another one promotes shoreline uses um, that provide public access and improves the condition and enhances water quality. And the third encourages federal facilities um, to maintain environmental management systems when managing hazardous materials. The historic preservation element generally remains the same. Um, in response to comments on green space, tree canopies, and gateways, a couple of policies in this element have been revised. Um, in response to a comment regarding the continued preservation of disposed historic properties, we modified an existing policy to ensure the continued preservation of federal historic properties through ongoing maintenance, while also adding a new policy um, to identify historic preservation protections before disposing of historic properties. The visitors and commemora commemoration element includes minor graphic and formatting changes, uh, responding to comments regarding local visitors, the accessibility of federal visitor attractions, commuter buses, maintenance, and transportation alternatives to reduce parking demand. Uh, we've modified a few policies and made minor revisions to the narrative. In response to public comments to provide background information, we've included a new introduction, a narrative to describe the four themes, and created a partner list in our action plan. 
Um, also, we've modified a few of the action items and have included additional action partners in response to public input. As a result of changes uh, to the federal elements, a new action item has been added um, to address ecosystem services. And all action items previously identified in the urban design element have been moved to this document. The revised 2016 federal elements are currently available on our website at ncpc.gov slash complan. Um, NCPC is requesting final approval of the 2016 federal elements um, to be effective 60 days after adoption. And this is tentatively scheduled for April 5th, 2016. Uh, this will allow for a smooth transition during the project review cycle and also um, allow us to notify applicant agencies, uh, regional partners, and also the public of the new effective date. Uh, with this update, uh, we are also moving away from printing the federal elements, and digital copy copies will be available on our website to print on demand. It is the executive director's recommendation that the commission approves the final adoption of the updated federal elements of the comprehensive plan. Policies will be effective 60 days after adoption. After the effective date, projects that have preliminary approval under the old policies will move forward using the 2004 comprehensive plan policies. Projects that have no preliminary approval will move forward using the new 2016 comprehensive plan policies. And also under special and unusual circumstances, applicant agencies can consult with NCPC staff to determine the applicable comprehensive plan policies. And notes, NCPC and the National Park Service are currently undertaking a small park study. Following the completion of the study, NCPC will update the parks and open space element, and the 2004 policies will remain in effect until updated. And notes, following commission adoption, staff will incorporate any changes as directed by the commission and will complete minor editorial updates to the text and graphics to ensure document accuracy and consistency. This concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pont. I note reading through many of the public comments reflects a high level of citizen and organization engagement, which is very good, very high quality comments. Speaking of public commenters, we have one um, public commenter, uh, Mr. Lindsley Williams. Welcome back. I see your name in the public comments. So. I, I've had a few things to yeah. say. Along you always have. Um, you have three minutes to say it this time. Okay. Well, <laughs> let's talk about that. Thank you. Uh, um, seriously, I have three things that I wanted to focus on in whatever time you grant me. The first is to simply italicize one of the remarks that was prominent in my letter, which is to say, as you go forward uh, with this plan and, and its adoption, and by the way, I didn't come down here today to say stop it, change it, you know, I, I almost wanted to bring champagne. Uh, <laughs> but um, I do feel that as the commission engages in its work over the next decade, um, that it really should try to break out security from urban design. To me, security is a whole different thing. And yes, there is an intersection, but I see them as having different inputs, different effects. And uh, as you go forward, I would try to do it as well with input from the architect of the Capitol, because although NCPC has no authority over those grounds, it, it is our nation's Capitol building. And I don't think we should do security without sort of remembering that dome thing down there. Um, second, um, some years ago, and this I think probably is something that only Mr. May, and maybe you, Mr. Chairman, and Mr. Dixon may remember, I appeared uh, out of some work I was doing with the DCBIA Committee on the Environment to ask about ways in which when we're faced with development issues that say you have to retain and control groundwater and all kinds of other discharges from properties, what do you do if you have a building that's 100% on a lot where you have to go figure out something? To my way of thinking, uh, the legislation already permits you to, to, to make arrangements with off-site places to do uh, something to improve the water uh, retention, to improve the water quality. And I look at federal lands as being an asset that could be utilized, not by right, but by a phone call and a conversation to say, 
is there something down in the lower reaches of, of a park holding, for example, uh, along the upper Anacostia, where if somebody came in and did some work with that land, they could make the discharge going downstream come out better than it would otherwise, get some credit for it, and fundamentally not affect the park's central mission, which you know might be to have visitors and recreation, but there's some wet, boggy areas anyway. And I actually put in a comment, and NCPC seemed to have agreed to it back when, but it didn't find its way in. Mike knows, Mike Sherman knows a little bit about this, and maybe he could say something if you want him to um, uh, about it. But my sense is that this sort of got lost in the shuffle. Basically, I think the plan is a really is, is a commendable piece of work. And uh, the final thing I wanted to talk a little bit about is urban design. Now, I don't know about new documents, see something or other that you just mentioned, uh, Ms. Dupont, um, because that, that I haven't read. But my sense is that on, on urban design, that this is going to be your document, not mine. I wouldn't have written it exactly the way you did, but again, it's not mine, so you go forward, it's yours. Um, on the Hyde Act itself, my sense is that the diagram is overly simplistic. It misses some points, and it implies things that I think are not quite there yet. Um, the di one of the differences in the Hyde Act is that while it con it's concerned about what streets are being faced, it doesn't talk about alleys or, for that matter, even rivers. And sometimes pr properties back up to that. Second, it seems to me that at times the, 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 the document should be structured in a way to inform your reviews of federal projects. And for that, I think it's, it does the job. Federal projects tend to be large, occupy whole blocks or squares, and they don't have to contend often with alleys and other kinds of things. But, Sorry. Um, so I, I would look to uh, possible changes there, but it, it, it works the way it is, really, it does. So uh, I think the, the recommendation that you have to adopt is fine as long as those principles that it talks about are applied with care and don't kind of climb over the edge from something that is a recommendation is something that borders on regulatory uh, uh, attitude. And so there's Thank that. You. And if you'll just give me another second, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, you talk about a 60 day period here. In the commission's, zoning commission's work, they gave six months. I don't know if six months is better, but it, are, are you comfortable with the 60 days? To me, if an agency is just about to put in something and has done it all up in terms of 2004, and then all of a sudden, this new thing, does it, does it disrupt uh, an agency in terms of its master planning? I, I would encourage some leeway about that. Um, and um, I would also encourage that, that, that as you look at this urban design thing particularly, and really the whole comp plan, if there are things in it that you know are coming along that are inconsistent with, to the, in your view, inconsistent with the just adopted ZRR, it would be nice to have that be known soon so that Peter can bring all that back so that you can start over again. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Mr. Williams, very much. Thank you. That ends the public comment period, and we'll return it to commission discussion. Um, I would note, Mr. Pond, at the bottom of page four, the EDR, you may want to change April 5, 2015 to 16. Okay. Thank you. Um, Discussion? Yeah. Mr. Shaw. And with our office having completed a big document that took eight years, I just want to commend the staff um, and, and myself for your leadership and the board for their, for their work. Um, just once again to reinforce, we are starting the district element update, amendment of the plan, um, beginning in April. Um, what will be new that will also round this out is we're adding a resilience element. So just bringing up the idea around climate change, um, a adaptation to housing and economic shocks as well. So, um, and then just once again, I want to reinforce what I said the first time about, um, I think that joint statement on page number two between the Office of Planning and NCPC is really, really powerful and I think is going to be a, um, you know, so, sort of forges a, a strong relationship, a strong bond going forward as we both think about our planning work. So, um, great, great work, you guys. Additional thoughts? Mr. Uh, Mr. Dixon. 
Mr. Chairman, first I uh, joined in a lot of the comments in terms of the work that's being done, uh, has been done. I've seen this thing evolve from quite a different document to where it is now. Great job. Uh, I also want to um, join uh, Mr. Williams on some of his concerns, and hopefully they can be noted and be used as we go forward at some time in the cycle. Uh, I want to point out to him that there has been some effort made uh, on the Anacostia River front uh, uh, to try to look at ways to redirect the water that flows through the Anacostia River into the park. Uh, and that's uh, so, so it's sort of a conceptual thing that we've done over in uh, east of the river. But uh, if it were to happen, it would help clean up some of the water as it passes by. So I think that's part of that effort. Uh, I do have another uh, concern that I want to raise. and. I uh, may do, I've never probably, I don't think I've abstained from much on the commission in all these years, but I may have to abstain at this point to, as a marker. And I have a call to action to the members of the commission. The one thing that is not addressed here, and maybe this isn't the forum, maybe the city is more the place for it, is employment. East of the river has a 20% unemployment rate. There is a huge amount of federal presence east of the river. Not just our efforts on the east campus of St. Elizabeth, but the billions of dollars that are going to be spent at Homeland Security and at the new Anacostia Boulding uh, base and on and on. I really think that the folks at this table and their agencies, there ought to be some effort to try to make sure that the economic development, the jobs that come out of some of this work comes into our community. Uh, with the proper energy and proper focus, I think this can happen. So I guess I'm going to abstain just to make the point that I hope as we go forward, there may be another item added at some point about jobs. It's a lot about land and parking and water and parks. Let's put the human piece in here. So maybe as we go forward with some of these huge projects, there can be some particular interest in hub zones and, 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 and community groups and people who live there who might benefit from them. And it doesn't leave and go to other parts of the country, if not the community. So a point is, I'd like to, maybe we ought to think about, you know, employment related to some of these projects and, and folks who can be a part of that. Uh, that's, that's my comment, Mr. Chair and, you, and, and members. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ms. White? Um, I just want to commend the staff. Having worked in a couple of planning departments, this is an extraordinary amount of work. And it's the, the matrix that you put together to allow us to see the breadth and the depth of the comments was really helpful. Um, and the way that it was all noted because it's one thing to manage the civic engagement process and to get people engaged, but to track all of the issues and address them the way that you did, I think, is really um, to be commended. Thank you. So it's this is a really great piece of work. Mr. May. Uh, so I would echo the the, uh, the commendation of the staff for, for getting through this and uh, thank the staff, especially for addressing the comments that. Uh, Park Service had uh, had on the draft document, uh, and with regard to Mr. Williams' comments, uh, I would say that even without uh, specific policies pushing in this direction, the Park Service is interested in pursuing the concept of taking on some le greater level of stormwater retention. Uh, and we have had some conversations with other agencies in the past. Uh, about that, but nothing that has ever really come to anything. Um, we're hopeful as we work through a whole variety of projects that we might be able to incorporate that. Um, there is a system that we might be able to take advantage of with the, the uh, DOEE's uh, stormwater credit trading system, which is, um, I still get, I think, still getting its legs, but there may be a way for the, the uh, even federal agencies to take advantage of that. So uh, we're looking at all those things, although we're looking into a lot of things, not to mention uh, trying to our best to maintain all of our properties. That's right. 
Um, yeah. Uh, and then the other thing I would mention uh, with regard to the uh, the Hyde Act, I think uh, Mr. Williams brings up some some good points about that. Um, you know, when it comes to some of the finer points, and there are a lot of finer points when it has when you're getting into the Hyde Act. Uh, and as evidence in the, the complexity of just negotiating that small change that occurred a, a short time ago, and then the uh, the zoning change that followed it uh, with regard to penthouses and how we treat those. There are a lot of finer points, and there are a lot of things that you don't think about until you actually start getting into the weeds. And uh, I think that, uh, and we did get into a lot of the weeds in the, the uh, Zoning Commission case that changed how we treated uh, penthouses. Uh, but in all of that, we didn't really address things like, well, what happens when a building faces a river and not uh, a, a public way? So, uh, and that has since come up. We did try to address things like alleys and some of the other finer points. So the, the zoning code, of course, is um, much more uh, prescriptive when it comes to uh, the regulation of height than the Height Act itself is. It, uh, it's that overarching principle, but the zoning code gets into the details. And uh, um, whether the, the uh, NCPC needs to get into the details in the same way, I'm not so sure. But I, it did occur to me not too long ago that there, was a, uh, there would be some substantial value in uh, the NCPC reviewing all of the changes that came through in the zoning regulation rewrite to see how, what the federal equivalent would be. Because there are all sorts of policies that are embedded in the zoning code having to do with things like you know, bicycle parking and storage and things like that. I mean, do they do all of these policies actually align? Um, because I think ideally they should. Uh, and the, some of the good work that was done in the zoning regulation rewrite should actually uh, echo through uh, what NCPC does. So, thanks. Ms. Wright. Yeah, um, um, it really was a sympathetic nice. remark. Because, I, but although we, we I, I am sort of relieved not to always have it be GSA that gets blamed. Um, but nevertheless, um, on the for, on this, I, I also was, wow, the matrix was so easy, even I understood it. Um, and and I'm, I just w want to note that um, we've been at GSA kind of Johnny One note on let's look at the long range effects of consolidation and first freeze the footprint, now reduce the footprint, and I'm so happy to see NCPC engage in a, in a, a, a this is complicated, and we don't know where it's going, but to see it um, um, reflected in the workplace element and to expand beyond locational policy and, you know, and, and quality of workplace and all the attendant things is, is um, very gratifying. Thank you. Thank you. Sensing no additional comment, uh, is there a recommendation on the EDR for the final adoption of the updated federal elements which are to become effective on or about April 5th, 2016? It's been moved and seconded. Um, all in favor of the EDR say aye. 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 Opposed no. Yep. And one abstention. One abstention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pont. That ends our action items. We have two information presentations. Um, so agenda item number 6A is an information presentation on the Pentagon Reservation Master Plan, and Mr. Hart has returned. Yeah, and I'll, I'll be brief, so. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the commission. Um, the uh, commission, as you, um, in case you were Wondering, the Commission reviewed the final uh, Pentagon Reservation Master Plan in May of 2015. And at that time, uh, the uh, Commission approved the Master Plan uh, with the exception of the, uh, the North Area, um, which you see here in this image. The Commission um, noted uh, back in May that the final Pentagon Master Plan did not meet the um, comprehensive plan uh, parking ratio of one space per four employees. Um, and that the Washington Headquarters Services should explore um, uh, a few things and in, in really looking at possibly parking reduction um, uh, and kind of linking that with environmental protection uh, in this north area 
um, again shown here, the north area is made up of the north village and uh, the north parking area. Um, and, um, and this area, if you recall, is where the, um, uh, a portion of the 500-year floodplain is, is located. Um, so that's why we were kind of focusing on that. Since, the time, uh, since that time uh, back in May, we've continued to meet with the uh, Washington Headquarters Services in an effort to understand how they can address the Commission's concern uh, regarding the identified uh, one to four parking ratio as well as uh, stormwater management. Um, they are uh, here now um, and will give us an update on uh, where they are uh, with this process. And um, finally, I just kind of wanted to leave you all with uh, what the existing uh, parking ratio was. Uh, this is all information from the 2015 master plan, so last year's master plan. Um, and um, it shows the existing ratio, the proposed ratio um, that was proposed in, in, in the, ma the final master plan, and then what the comprehensive plan ratio uh, is, uh, is for it. And with that, um, I'll introduce uh, Commissioner Rhodes, uh, who will provide the uh, commission on a, a brief update on the Pentagon master plan. Great. Thank you. Uh, f first, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to uh, Thank the, uh, the commission staff, as always, for doing just tremendous work, and uh, they've been working with our staff in uh, uh, addressing some of these issues and, and some of these uh, concerns that were raised previously. Uh, I'd uh, also like to specifically recognize uh, Ms. Elizabeth uh, Linick, who is with me here today. She is our senior master planner for these uh, couple hundred acres here in this little the little building that, uh, that sits there. Um, Addressing a, a few areas just for update, I think we have, uh, in, in the subsequent discussions and the great dialogue that has occurred, we've, we've gotten to uh, a, a comfort level on the stormwater management plans uh, and then the environmental permits and other things that arise. We've been able to come to a consensus that uh, all, all the stormwater management plans are in place and moving forward and our, and our, our permits with the uh, Department of Environmental Quality with the State of Virginia. Uh, which are provisionally, uh, provisionally approved for the 2018 iteration of it are all satisfied. So that has addressed the stormwater management and other elements of the north parking area. And related to that, we do have a project that's going to be up there in North Village on the left-hand side. It's kind of in black right now. And that was part of the concern as well because that's right on the fringe of the 500-year floodplain. And if we had environmental issues, is that good, et cetera. And, and I think we've been able to address more. We're, we're going to address that further at a later point. But I think that's been able to satisfy some of those concerns because that is up on a higher elevation it is on the outside and on the fringe of the 500 year floodplain so that aspect of the dialogue from the last one I, I believe we're in general mutual agreement and we'll have a subsequent final approval and resubmission that that'll take care I think that'll address that um, on the parking I did want to update uh, uh, the Commission on on some actions uh, related to that um, on our uh, property and land use on our parking demand and on our personnel counts. Um, I had mentioned the last time we uh, presented this topic that we've got a lot of other um, initiatives underway that I think complicate the ability to definitively uh, determine how we might get further along in the parking ratio. So I, uh, but I do want to update you on those. So um, we are in, throughout the national capital region with our good friends at GSA, we are working to reduce our uh, lease footprint by about 20%. And that's a multi-year plan we're, we're well on the way. It's all programmed. Uh, we're about 30 of the 93 project lines have already been completed, uh, and that'll be completed between now and 2020, uh, just from a cost and other dynamic perspective, and we're moving folks into other existing bases and stations that we have in the area. Uh, as a follow-on to that, uh, I'm going through an initiative now. Uh, we're, we're actually surveying all the remaining lease space at 80%, every single workstation and the demand that's exactly there. What was the original demand and what is it now? Uh, and additionally, we're doing the same on our owned property to, uh, to include the Pentagon. We're going to go through every one of the spaces and decide in order to determine how we can further reduce the lease footprint in order to take advantage of our existing owned space. It just, it's, a, it's a prudent uh, approach to go forward. Uh, but my expectation is that over time, we're actually going to work a transition plan to move some more folks into the Pentagon. But I've got to determine that still. That's one of my complicating factors in the, in the near-term uh, factor. Uh, additionally, we are working with the state of Virginia who is going to be expanding the hot lanes further north, as you may be aware, uh, from what is right now mile marker three on the Edsel Road area of, uh, of uh, 395 up to uh, up through the rest of 395, which really makes the Pentagon the terminus. Um, the current experience they have is about a 50 to 60 percent increase in vehicles per day on the section that they did expand. 
Um, we are near our capacity throughputs on our reservation right now, so we're working together. We're in, we're in deliberate planning right now to work together. Uh, as we had mentioned last time we had presented, we do have a plan that's going to take away about 1,300 parking places. A significant portion of that was our own work we were already underway to figure out how to better absorb our existing traffic on the reservation. We have uh, uh, about 1,800 bus routes from WMATA and everybody else in the area coming through there a day. It's, it's the second busiest transit point for the populace, not just for the Pentagon, for the populace, between the metro, the buses, uh, our van pools, uh, slugs, uh, all, all those other dynamics uh, that come through there. So we had our own project that was going to take away parking in order to better facilitate that traffic. We now need to integrate that with uh, VDOT's plans to figure out how on each side we can best complement one another to absorb what's going to be the increase, increasing load. I don't know that that's not going to change the project we had planned. I don't know that that won't take away more spaces. I, I just don't know yet. We're working that over the course of the next year, and then they're going to start that extension project, I think, in 17, going through about a year or so in, in the process to take forward. Um, lastly, uh, as we left here last time, the other element that I had worked with staff on uh, was trying to better define what exactly is our population there at the Pentagon. I did make a mental note that for the past uh, uh, past about 17 years, it has been, is this, yeah, about past 17 years, it has been 23,000. But for 10 of those 17 years, that 23,000 was when we had 10% of our fit folks out of the building because we were renovating the building. So it was either that we lied to you for 10 of those years or that we actually had a different number of people there. Um, so we've gone back, we've gone through all our building plans of the renovation, the five wedges uh, and sections for all the workstations we've built. We've identified all our population and, and we've, got a, we've got a refined population that's actually an accurate count. We've also in the last year gone through the new Homeland Security Presidential Directive 12 uh, requirement for, uh, for how we do our access control system so we actually have a better accurate count of everybody that's coming in and out. And, and from those counts, we know that we're, we're closer in the 26,000 range now that we have completed the renovation and brought folks, folks back. We can plus or minus a little bit on there, and we're going to work to refine that. But even with that, nonetheless, if we do reduce by the 1,300, we plan for the, to absorb the uh, flow on the installation. And, and with our accurate count, it still only takes us to a 1 to 3.7 at the end state. So we're not quite there, but got a lot of variables we're trying to work through, and I see us as better addressing the degree to which and how we can get closer towards that final step uh, when we get to the, quite frankly, to the next iteration of the master plan. I think this is the detail we can give at this point. I know where we're committed towards, uh, but we'll continue to work that with staff. So those are the uh, steps that we've taken in, uh, since the last update and, and where we're progressing on the effort. And certainly if there are specific questions, uh, again, the real brains of the outfit is over there in Miss Linick if, if we need direct them there. And about when is the next master plan update? Uh, I assume it's 2020, I mean 2015. Yeah. This one's 2015. Usually they're five years that yeah. the, uh, <clears throat> usually, usually we look at five years for um, a master plan to be updated, um, but it's up to the Pentagon to figure out where they you know, when they're actually going to be coming in for that. Uh, well, right now we're planning our next iteration. Yeah, identify yourself, please, just for the record. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Elizabeth Lennick, Chief Master Planner, Pentagon Reservation. Thank you. So uh, what we'd like to do is discuss how do we get north parking out of what I call the doghouse, where it wasn't approved in the 2015. <coughs> I think one idea would be we can do an addendum to show our uh, the, the population as we understand it. That would be option one. We can do an updated TMP, uh, which would accommodate the parking ratio and show our increased master plan population, I mean our increased Pentagon uh, population. Or the other thing we can do is wait until the uh, next iteration of the master plan, which is five years right. from 2015. So we'll you know, certainly want to work with you to get the uh, North Village and North Parking in, under your approval. We, uh, Mr. Chairman, we had been on, uh, again, the last master plan was 2005, so that shows a 10-year gap in there. But in there, we were also in the middle of the renovation and hadn't really brought all the folks back, so we waited till the end of that to start laying this out. Um, the, the reason I mention, I think, at the end state, at the end of the day, the, uh, the next five-year iteration probably is closer is again because we will have completed the work with VDOT and the hot lanes will have been resolved. We will have hopefully by then completed our supplemental uh, complementary project on our south parking 
to work with what the Hot Lanes expansion will be. They won't be perfectly aligned. Ours will probably tail it just a little bit. And certainly, uh, abs yes, I definitely will have uh, completed all the review in the census of all our lease space and Pentagon space and figured out what our transition plans are. So we'll have the definitive numbers certainly to put in there for all those elements. Thank you, Mr. Rhodes. Yes, sir. Any questions for Mr. Hart or Mr. Rhodes? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Dixon. Uh, I, th I think the <clears throat> idea of reducing parking is to try to reduce uh, use of cars. Is that kind of the idea? Yep. Uh, I just wonder, uh, I tend to go over in that area a lot. Unfortunately, the shop, sometimes my city will forgive me for spending tax dollars. But <laughs> Pentagon City uh, parking lot is a very interesting building. They've been spending a phenomenal amount of money automating it. So you can tell where every space is located by floor. And it's almost empty 90% of the time. So they're getting ready for you. <laughs> I don't know how many spaces got, but uh, Colonial Parking is going to be real happy. Uh, and I'm, maybe some of the soldiers and the folks at the Pentagon, I used to be one of them, I walked those halls of many a day, are going to be have to pay for parking, probably, because I don't think it's going to stop the high-speed transit, the highway system from bringing cars in. This means that they're going to be no free parking on the Pentagon grounds. and these parking lots. Well, I guess it's outsourcing in a way. So, but I just think is that is that is the idea to really stop people driving or is it really going to be probably more making people find other places to park in the area? That's the concern. I, my, my assumption is that it'll be uh, probably a little of both. We already have folks parking over there. Visitors yeah. who come, we only have so many visitor spaces. So yeah. visitors who come, I was one of those before I was assigned there at the Pentagon. That's where I'd park. I'd park over at the mall and pay for it and walk over. Um, now, the, the other thing I would just highlight is they're, they're kind of qualitative, not quantitative. Well, they are quantitative, but they're not really for the parking ratios. But I will just highlight that in addition to the other areas of the, uh, the regional transit that we support, um, uh, uh, we've set aside and we will continue to set aside. We have 589 permits that are, excuse me, 789 permits that are all for Vanpool carpool. Um, and of those, we do know from our last transportation management plan that 475 of the riders have nothing to do with the Pentagon. They just come up with the carpool, they grab the metro, and then they go into D.C. So we're facilitating that. We also have, a, uh, from our last count, uh, 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 roughly about 3,000 a day each way that are slugs that are riding up. And there's a good number of those that ride up and are able to do that because of folks who park in the Pentagon. I, I'm, I'm a perfect example. I pick up two every morning because I have a single occupancy vehicle parking permit. Yep. Uh, but I pick up two every morning and take back two every day. Not because I love them, but because I like the free ride on the hot lanes. Um, and and we, we, our, our estimations are about 40 or 50 percent, it looks like, when we do our counts of them picking up, have the Pentagon tag in there so we can kind of estimate it. So um, now how many of them are working the Pentagon or not, you know, it's, it's hard to really differentiate. But I think larger than our population is being directly serviced by the parking lot that is uh, supporting it there. But it's hard to quantify, but we know that those are factors as well. Yeah. Sensing no further questions. Thank you, Mr. Hart. And the last item on our agenda is an information presentation on the 11th Street Bridge Park. Ms. Lee. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission. The District Department of Transportation, in collaboration with the local nonprofit Building Bridges Across the River, are here today to provide an information presentation on the 11th Street Bridge Park project. I'm going to provide a brief introduction before I turn the presentation over to Scott Kratz, who is the director of the 11th Street Bridge Park. Just to orient you to the site, the 11th Street Bridge is located in southeast Washington, D.C., on the Anacostia River connecting the historic Anacostia with the Capitol Hill neighborhoods. The Washington Navy Yard is located on the, to the west of the river, and the National Park Service Anacostia Park on the east. The bridge park will be constructed on top of the existing piers from the old 11th Street Bridge across the Anacostia River, and you can see the piers highlighted in red here. Here you can see a closer look at the site. As you may recall, in 2011, the Commission approved the replacement of the 11th Street Bridge Complex, which included a pair of bridges built in the 1960s 
that span the Anacostia River linking the southeast southwest 6, 695 freeway with the Anacostia freeway or 295. At the time, the purpose of the project was to improve highway connection and separate local and freeway traffic by building several bridges and ramps. As you can see in this image, the red hatch represents the old bridges that have been eliminated and the yellow and orange represent the new structures that have been built. This separate project triggered the 11th Street Bridge Park initiative and sparked the idea of transforming an old infrastructure into the city's first elevated park. These aerial photos give you an idea of the previous condition of the bridge here and the approved bridge replacement project which has been built. And finally, in this image, you can see the current conditions of the bridge. The deck of the old bridges have been removed and the old piers remain adjacent to the new bridges. The proposed park will be located on top of the old downstream bridge piers. You can see highlighted in red. <coughs> the bridge park will be a destination for recreation, arts, and education. NCPC participated in the design oversight committee providing feedback on the design principles that guided the 11th Street Bridge Park competition. And in the last couple of years, the project team has provided informal presentations to NCPC staff to discuss the status of the project. The applicant is here today to provide an overview to the commission as they continue to develop the feasibility study. We anticipate that the concept design will come before the commission in the fall of 2016. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Scott to continue the presentation. Uh, <clears throat> good afternoon, um, the um, chairman and uh, members of the commission. Um, the, it's a pleasure to be with you today. My name is Scott Kratz. I'm the director of the 11th Street Bridge Park, which is a project of the nonprofit, um, the East of the River based, um, appropriately named Building Bridges Across the River at the Ark. And we are working, uh, this is a collaboration working with city agencies. This project began um, the, out of the office of the DC Office of Planning, um, the, and now we're working most closely with the uh, District Department of Transportation with DDOT um, to realize this. Um, we, of course, will come back um, the, uh, multiple times as we go through a formal review, but in working with the staff here at NCPC, we thought it'd be helpful to give an overview of um, the presentation and um, the allow an opportunity for questions and comments. So what I'm going to do this afternoon um, the, is talk a little bit about the site of the um, Bridge Park, um, the, a lot about our community engagement strategy, um, the, the design that was selected and how we got there, and then finally the next steps. Um, but before we do that, um, before we sort of dive deep in there, I wanted to have a single slide to talk, oh, there we go. Um, There we go. Great. Good. Thank you. Technical difficulties. Um, to talk a, a little bit on a macro level that increasingly I think everyone on this, um, the commission will recognize that cities are really being defined by their civic spaces, right? Um, and increasingly cities are looking at inventive ways to transform old infrastructure into those new civic spaces. Um, whether it's the very successful 606 um, the, in Chicago that just opened up to great acclaim last summer, um, the been following that project very carefully, um, and the uh, existing old um, infrastructure that has aged out reached the end of their lifespan that now are helping to connect communities. Whether that's the Walnut Street Bridge in Chattanooga, uh, the Shelby Street Bridge in um, the Nashville, my favorite named bridge, the Purple People Mover Bridge um, the, in Cincinnati. Um, and I think what's really inter interesting about all of these projects is that these, this infrastructure not only connects two sides um, the, of a disconnected community, but they also re-engage with the waterfront. And I think that's um, the, a critical interest both for NCPC and the city at large. And I think what's germane um, the, to the bridge park 
is that one of the reasons why, um, the, of course, that the uh, capital was founded here um, the, in Washington, D.C., is we sit at the confluence of the Potomac and the eastern branch of the Potomac. Now, of course, we know it as um, the Anacostia River. And yet, up until recently, we haven't really defined ourselves as a river city, right? I think that's starting to change, and certainly that's a key goal of the bridge park. Um, the, but uh, the, uh, to activate um, the, and engage the rivers and think about rivers not as um, the um, the geography that separates um, the but geography that can connect this community. So, where is the 11th Street Bridge Park? Um, the as Ms. Lee um, the mentioned, Vivian mentioned, um, the 11th Street bridges connect the communities of Capitol Hill um, the and the Navy Yard um, the with the communities east of the river of Anacostia and Fairlawn. Of all of the images um, the that I show, this is probably going to be the most helpful of physically trying to show what we're doing with the project. So to point of reference here, um, the, in the bottom left-hand corner is the U.S. Navy Yard. Um, the, uh, the, on the right-hand side is Anacostia Park, uh, National Park Service property. Just off to the side on the right is Historic Anacostia, the Historic Anacostia Business District. This slide shows an image of the old spans and the new spans on a single picture. So the orange and the light gray uh, spans at the top and the bottom of this picture are the old spans. So these are spans that were built in between 1962 and 1967. They reached the end of their lifespan and needed to be replaced. And those are replaced with the three gray bands that you see in the center. The top two gray bands are freeway bridges, um, but we're most interested in the bottom two. The bottom dark gray band is the 11th Street Local Bridge um, that opened up about two years ago, um, an award-winning bridge built by uh, the District Department of Transportation um, the, that's already done a wonderful job of helping to reconnect two sides of, of this river, uh, the communities on both sides. And one thing to point out is that this new 11th Street Local Bridge has a 16-foot wide pedestrian and bike path um, the, that's done a great job of reconnecting to the waterfronts on both sides. And as we move forward with transforming part of the old span, that orange span is where the bridge park will be. We're building in, in the existing uh, old right-of-way. Um, we see actually stitching together to and connecting to that 16-foot wide pedestrian and bike path so that you could be biking or walking up from the baseball stadium and the busy yards park area down by the Navy Yard, zip over to the bridge park, and then continue going over to historic Anacostia or vice versa. The uh, river walk on the, on the Navy Yard side is now open 24 hours a day, which is an enormous um, the benefit to the community. And the river walk on the other side of the river in Anacostia, um, DDOT and National Park Service are working on a tremendous um, the effort to extend the Anacostia River Trail all the way to Bladensburg, um, the, which then will connect to the Capitol Crescent Trail and so forth. So we see that the 11th Street Bridge Park can help connect a larger constellation of activities on both sides of the river. So this is a picture of what one of the old spans of the bridge used to look like. Uh, and working with the Office of Planning, we thought the, um, the green deck had a beautiful industrial patina to it. Uh, most people thought it was really um, hideous, uh, <laughs> and ugly, but more importantly, uh, and I've learned more about bridge engineering than I ever thought I would want to know working on this project, um, the, it turned out that the deck itself would have been cost prohibitive to save. It was built in the 1960s, and there's a reason why that was being replaced. But the other thing that we found out is one of the most expensive parts about building any river bridge in particular is not necessarily the deck, although that's part of it, it's the piers that hold all the load, right, that hold all the live load and the dead load. The piers um, the, are in relatively good shape. If you went out there today, you would see something that looked like this. Um, the, um, so our plan is to reuse those old piers um, the, to then build a new deck that's on top, but one that no longer has to hold cars or tractor trailers, but that can hold community-generated programming ideas. So this project has four, table, uh, four uh, key goals. These are our um, legs of the, the entire project stands on. Um, public health is critically important, providing a safe place to play. Reengaging people with the Anacostia River, this uh, uh, I'm happy to say is no longer a hidden resource. Um, the, it's being discovered, but we think that this bridge park can play a big role in that. Um, the river has also been a dividing line for generations in this city. And I think of all the goals that, of this project, this is the goal that most viscerally connects with people. How do we create a physical and metaphorical bridge between the communities? And finally, if this becomes a real destination, this can become an anchor for equitable and inclusive development, something that I'll be talking about a little bit more at the end of the um, presentation today. 
So we started um, the for two years um, just going out and listening to the community. Um, the, we gave presentations to civic groups like um, the Anacostia Coordinating Council, uh, Historic Anacostia Block Association, ANC commissions, uh, residents, church leaders. We had over 200 meetings over those first two years asking two very simple questions. One, is this something that the community wanted? Um, the, in essence, asking for permission. Um, and we heard lots of really enthusiastic responses in those 200 plus meetings and then we said well okay then help us shape it what kind of programming can we put on this bridge park that can help shape the that can help meet the needs of the nearby community and interestingly we kept hearing the same ideas for programming on both sides of the river um, the these ideas that you see up here today uh, public art that tells the rich history of the region urban agriculture less community garden spaces more of edible landscapes that could form the backdrop for farmers markets or healthy cooking classes Performance space was actually the number one idea that we kept hearing from the community, a space that people can gather from across the region and build social capital. Access to the river, um, the, particularly on the Ward 8 side, uh, east of the river, um, a intergenerational play space, and an education center that we can inspire the next generation of river stewards. So we took these community ideas and we uh, the, um, launched a million dollar pre-capital campaign of which we've more than exceeded um, the, to launch a nationwide design competition to take these community inspired programming ideas and manifest them in something real. Um, it was really important that um, the, well, two things. One, um, you never know when you throw a party, is anybody going to show up? But we had um, 254 firms register, 81 firms uh, formally apply, um, four final teams. Um, and what was really critical is, like we've been doing from the beginning, uh, of engaging all of our stakeholders as part of this process. So we created, as Vivian mentioned, a design oversight committee that was comprised of residents on both sides of the river, National Park Service, the Navy Yard, DOEE, uh, the NCPC, uh, the, um, lots of local and federal agencies to help us review the design brief before it even went out to the public, um, the participate in um, presentations and discussions, extensive discussions with the four final design teams, and at the end, use the same criteria that our jury had to rank um, the, the winning design. Um, the, and wonderfully, um, the, both the design oversight committee of the community and our jury were unanimous on the same design which is the design by the architecture firm of OMA, working out of the New York office, and the landscape architecture firm has done a lot of work here in the district, um, the Olin. Um, and what the design did um, the, is something that's really simple. It's really, it's using the old piers, it's two trusses that come together, using an engineering device that's been used for generations, but in a really innovative way, where these two trusses can come together and meet right in the center for the center gathering place. And the idea for these, this point of connection was inspired by this point of intersection, this point, this point of two sides of, the, of, the, of DC and the region of coming together that, as the designers explained, um, the, in turn was inspired by the Benjamin Banneker and Pierre L'Enfant plan for Washington, DC, this point of intersection, this point of coming together. And in looking at the, before they even began the design work, the design team looked at the existing context, where on one side of the river, it's full of lots of hardscape. Um, the, it's lots of concrete um, the, on the north side of the river, um, the, or west of the river. And on the, um, the uh, Ward 8 side of the river, um, east of the river, there um, is much green, lush landscape, um, the, particularly with the National Park Service. So in the design scheme, um, the, they tried to reverse that and to put more, insert more um, green space um, the in passive space inside the Capitol Hill Navy Yard side and make sure that the Ward 8 side had a very active um, the place that could be a real destination. So that includes, this is the view coming in looking from historic Anacostia, these two planes that come together. The trusses themselves um, the make a um, space for an outdoor amphitheater, 280 person amphitheater. Um, water plays a key role, at least in the, some of the design schemes, because we're over water. One of the key design elements as part of the competition was uh, engaging with the river below. The uh, water plays a role not only uh, acoustically, but also aesthetically. They're exploring the idea of working with artists to um, the, do some projections on the waterfall and public art writ large across the um, park. Frederick Douglass used to walk across the Navy Yard Bridge every single day on his way to work. How do we make sure we capture some of that rich history and share it with a broader um, the audience um, the, who comes here? Um, 
the Anacostia Watershed Society, um, the NDOEE, were part of our design oversight committee, and they really challenged all of the design teams to, to think, how do we move beyond do no harm to the river? Can we actually think about improving the river quality itself, which was an exciting idea. And one of the ideas um, the, was uh, on the uh, waterfall on the top of the bridge, have it be a closed loop system, but the waterfall underneath, where it doesn't have public access, one of the big challenges for the Anacostia River is a lack of oxygen due to um, the sedimentation and due to algae blooms. Is this an opportunity to, um, the, in a very small way, in a demonstration way, just by picking up the water and dropping it again, working with the, uh, the environmental firm, can help um, the reoxygenate the water. But we're looking at a series of ecological strategies, which I'll talk about more in a second, um, the, to engage with the river itself. Those waterfalls are intentionally placed just outside the Environmental Education Center. And as I mentioned, these are part of a larger series of ecological strategies to engage people with the Anacostia River itself. The last couple images to share um, the, from the design is a cafe, a restaurant, um, the, a place that um, the, has really remarkable views of the river itself. If you think about it, there's lots of places here in Washington, D.C. where you can cross rivers, but not necessarily stop and linger and take in these views. Um, and the views actually um, the, on the end of the piers um, the, are really quite remarkable, looking all the way down to the National Airport. It actually gets you up high enough. You can see over the Navy Yard to see the Capitol Building and the Washington Monument, um, the, and a place where both sides of the river can gather to enjoy the environment, the arts, culture, and physical activity. So where are we now? Um, the, uh, we've spent the live, we're working on this for about four years, four plus years. Um, the, we are working with DDOT now on the, to uh, the, um, have a contract on the, with a civil engineering firm to begin some of our pre-construction work, so as a larger feasibility study, to look at um, permitting, right-of-way, environmental assessment, not doing that work, but mapping it out. We knew we need for due diligence to go in and do load testing of the old piers to make sure that we understand the structural capacity. Um, the, and continuing work with the community and the, uh, the design team to refine these more than concepts into 15%, 30% design and, and forward. We're continuing to engage with the community at every step. Um, the, to date, we've had a little more than 600 meetings um, the, with uh, community representatives, not just of the local region, although that's been our focus, but um, the, in the broader uh, DMV area. And one of the best pieces of advice we've heard from like-minded parks around the country is don't wait until we open, which would be at the earliest at 2019, but get people down to the site now, early and often. So uh, we are partnering with the National Park Service for a second year in a row for the second annual Anacostia River Festival. Um, the last year, we, re uh, we had 6,000 people come down to the river. Uh, we built an 80-foot floating dock in the river. I now know how many permits you need for a one-day floating dock in the river. <laughs> it's five, in case anybody's curious, but, uh, the, but it was great. Uh, the, we had bands. There was a bike parade. Um, the, and for one day, it brought people from uh, Anacostia and Capitol Hill and Congress Heights and Bethesda and the entire city to come down. The mayor was there, city council members, Congressman Norton, um, saved the date for April 17th, um, the 2016. Building on that, um, the, we're thinking more broadly um, the, uh, about other ideas to engage with the river, um, the, and we still have money to raise for this um, project, which is ambitious, but the idea of a temporary Anacostia beach um, the, um, right down by the river, uh, either this summer or in future summers. Um, the, we've identified about $200,000 in funding, but we need another about $100,000. But, but beaches are wonderfully democratic spaces, right? Um, the places where um, the, the folks from all walks of life can come down um, and show a common civic space and for all, and this has been successful in Toronto in Paris in Detroit um, the uh, in Philadelphia um, the and this is a way for us not only to bring people down to the river but also to test pilot and evaluate programming ideas in addition um, the we are uh, collaborating with the University Dis District of Columbia on um, the two uh, install this spring um, the pop-up urban gardens, working in collaboration with the local faith community in Ward 6 and Ward 8. We've identified four of about six total sites. Um, the, uh, we're now expanding that to potential school sites as well. A series of arts interventions um, the, on both sides of the river, which really we worked for uh, several years ago with graduate urban planning students from Virginia Tech to identify 
the where some of the cha walkability and accessibility study. And one of the big challenges is the freeways on both sides. Um, the, and we will be working with the Anacostia Art Center to create a uh, mural underneath the uh, Good Hope Road underpass to engage the residents with the amazing Anacostia Park, a National Park Service um, the parcel, as well um, the, as the river itself. And finally, the last thing to mention, um, is that, and this goes to Mr. Dixon's point um, the, uh, earlier in this uh, conversation, um, we know that these kind of signature parks increase property values nearby. Um, the, that can be a good thing if you own your house. It can be a really challenging thing if you're a renter and this puts undue pressure um, the, on rising housing prices. Um, in short, how do we ensure that the thousands of people that have helped shape this project from the beginning can be the ones that benefit from it? So we've spent the last year and a half working with senior scholars from the Urban Institute, uh, the Office of Planning, um, the, the DC Fiscal Policy Institute, uh, the uh, LISC DC, a local community development corporation, to create a series of stakeholder meetings and public meetings over the last year uh, in 2015 to create a series of recommendations in three categories, uh, workforce development, small business enterprises, and housing. We announced this plan uh, two months ago um, that in East of the River Economic Summit, um, we're now starting to implement some of these plans. Um, the equitable development plan is up on our website at bridgepark.org. We are now working with the Urban Institute to put clear measurable goals on each of the 19 recommendations that we can move forward for green workforce training. We're starting a, uh, a home buyers club in Ward 8. Uh, we're exploring the idea of uh, starting a community land trust in collaboration with City First Homes. Um, the lots of different activities to ensure that this is a park um, the, that everyone um, the, can enjoy and continue to stay there. So the um, timeline for the equitable development on the work has been uh, over the last 16 months. And now comes the really fun part is actually implementing the plan. Um, so working together with the community, um, the, we're confident that we can make uh, a new civic space that can support the community's physical, environmental, cultural, um, and economic health. Um, with that, that was a lot to sort of take in. Um, the would be more than happy. I wanted to uh, make sure we left enough time for any comments or questions or thoughts or concerns. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Katz. Who is the designer? Uh, the designer um, is uh, Jason Long on the at OMA, and it's Hallie Boyce from Olin. So it's Olin and OMA. It's, um, as part of the design competition, we made sure that um, the, it was a team because we knew that this would be both an architecture and a landscape architecture on the effort. So uh, Olin and OMA. Good. Very, very nice. Thank you. It's a very exciting project. Wow. Um, comments or questions for Mr. Katz? Mr. Mr. Yield. Mr. May, you won the coin toss. <laughs> I was pointing at him, but that's okay. The, um, uh, so uh, your, your schedule for completing design and pre-construction activities through, through this year and next, and then start construction sometime in 2017? Wait, end of 2017? End of 2017. Um, and so there's a, to answer that, yes. I'm just curious about the, whether you're, you'll have all of your funding in place by, the, by that time. Is it, how's it going on the funding side? Funding, yes, good question. Um, the, so we anticipate a $45 million capital campaign that includes $35 million for construction. Uh, we're building in an endowment as part of that, too. Um, the, um, one of the, uh, it's critical to be thinking about uh, long-term operations and maintenance, which is a whole other conversation. But uh, the city has, to date, has committed $8.35 million. Um, the, we've raised an additional $3 million on top of that. And by the end in, of midway through this year in the first two quarters, we have set a goal that's an ambitious one, but it's doable um, the, to announce, and we're well on our way of this, of three signature seven or eight figure gifts from three different categories, a foundation. So we were able to announce a $1.2 million investment from the Kresge Foundation uh, just a few months ago. There's a pending seven figure gift um, the, from local philanthropy um, that's been very engaged with us. Uh, and then we are in wonderful conversations, uh, long-term conversations, with not one but two corporations who are interested in uh, the investing in this well, one of which could be seven or even eight bigger gifts. What's key to answer your question, though, uh, Mr. May, is uh, we want to make sure we know exactly where the funding is and in hand before we start construction. It's critical. Yeah, I, would, I think so. Um, <laughs> Indeed. The, uh, and the, the last... Uh, I. It's not clear from any of the diagrams, and I haven't looked at the plans in a while, but um, have, uh, to what extent is any of the construction on the east side going to be on 
uh, land that's currently park service that's <coughs> supposed to be transferred to the district? We are building within the existing right-of-way, so there was a transfer of jurisdictional authority in 1967. So completely within the existing completely transfer? Completely within okay. the um, plan. There might be some um, staging, some construction area. Yeah. That and, that's, and that's not a big deal. Yeah. I just I, I don't want to run afoul of it the law that authorized the transfer for Poplar Point, which could complicate your life. So, got enough complications. Um, and I assume that you're talking to um, the superintendent about, um, I, well, actually, where do you actually, actually have in mind doing the beach? Uh, in right down next to the, uh, the site of the bridge park itself. So, and we're working very closely with um, superintendent, oh, superintendent. Um, the, and all of his staff. So, okay, that's what I want. Uh, for that and for the River Festival. The River Festival itself also happens in the... Um, well, right, and the River Festival is a joint effort, but I hadn't heard anything about the beach from the superintendent. I mean, I'd heard about the beach, but not from the superintendent, so I just want to make sure you're talking to him. Yep. Okay, thanks. Every other week meetings, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Scott, you've gone a come a long way. <laughs> I think... I think I'm correct in saying one of your first public presentations before the Anacostia Coordinating Council, and, which I chair. Yep. And we've been excited then and we're excited now. I do have some questions Please. because it's always a matter of allocation of resources. And there's something I like to call cream always. Cash rules actions made. Cash. Let's talk budget first. And this is not this is just to get clear but clear. What is the total and anticipated budget? for completion of the project? Uh, total completion would be, uh, our capital campaign is $45 million, but that is $35 million for construction and $10 million for an endowment. Okay. Now, so so that's $45 million. Yep. What would your programming costs be? Have you estimated what programming costs might be? That's a great question. Um, the We are um, planning to follow uh, the a very similar path as the ARC. So the okay. ARC, as you know, um, but perhaps other people might not know, it's a 110,000 square foot facility. It's located east of the river um, the, that is operated by 10 different nonprofits. Um, the, and each of the different programming areas, as we see, would be run by a different nonprofit managed by building bridges across the river at the ARC. So for instance, an Anacostia Watershed Society that has been doing environmental education for the last 27 years could run the Environmental Education Center. Uh, University of District of Columbia is keenly interested in uh, running the uh, urban ag um, part of the bridge park. Uh, performance, we're talking to several different performing um, the nonprofits that could run the performance area. That makes this project more complicated, but at the same time, it brings the expertise in uh, people that are experts at this um, the, to manage those sites, and it also make, ensures the long-term financial sus sustainability about the, of this project because they're bringing in not only the human capital, but uh, or they're bringing in not only the expertise, but also the human capital um, the, to uh, the help manage those facilities. I don't have an exact number for O and M um, the for operations and maintenance. That's one of the things we're working on um, the in the next six months of the feasibility study. And and embedding an O&M consultant really early in this uh, to ensure that we're driving that number down as much as we can. And the last thing I'll say is that we've been, I've been um, the traveling around the country talking to like-minded parks about that very issue of how do we ensure that the, that long-term financial sustainability is key. So visiting parks in Governors Island and Brooklyn Bridge Park and Louisville and a bunch of other places. I think the sustainability is a, is a big question uh, because uh, the Anacostia Park is often shut down at night because of other for reasons. So if you're going to have a park like this, then the control of it and the management of it and programming is critical. We're also struggling now with the, uh, not struggling, but the RISE Center is trying to do a lot of programming efforts too, which have been somewhat successful. Uh, I have a, a, another, so a, lot, a few other questions, and I don't want to exhaust this commission with too many because I'm pretty close to this. <laughs> uh, but. Um, the, the many things that you cited, the urban agriculture, the beach programming, River Fest, we like all those. But can we have them keep, hopefully we can keep having those even if we don't have the bridge. Or we could have it with the bridge. No, exactly. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I, and absolutely. I mean, I said I'm excited, stay excited. I want to see it, and you're doing it, and that's good. But what the other things that give cachet to the bridge are things which are functioning now on existing green space. Uh, and I think that, that we hope we can keep a commitment with those. Um, I think that the 
Well, you'll be back. We'll talk more. But keep up your good work. I think it's a really exciting idea, and we've got a lot of things we'd like to see happen on our side. The one thing I would like folks to note, and maybe some people may not know it, you should see the existing bridge structure that's there. You had a slide that sort of showed it, and uh, it gets people from one side to the other, which is what we're trying to make happen. And yours will help draw them to the middle, but we want to make sure we get folks to come together. And the park is also very useful for that purpose, too. So keep up your good work. Thank you. I appreciate the additional information. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dixon, very much. Other questions for Mr. Katz? Ms. White? I had a couple of questions, but first, wow. I mean, it's a really elegant, beautiful design concept. Certainly you've created an incredible amount of excitement or tapped into a lot of excitement from the community. And I love that you're thinking about uh, what we call uh, the unintended consequences, as you said, of park uh, value of properties going up because of not just park investments, but any kind of public infrastructure investment. So I, I think that's really important that you're addressing it now. And I'm I'm just going back to some things you were talking quickly, and I didn't quite get it all. But the so the capital campaign being 45, 35 for construction, 10 for endowment, which I think is really smart. But they, these are pre-engineering construction numbers, right? I mean, because you don't have the... As part of the design competition, we'd ask for estimates um, mm -hmm. the, that are very preliminary estimates, yeah. to be sure. But as part of this uh, six months feasibility study, we're going to be doing a much deeper dive. Those cost estimates did come from a separate firm that was hired, um, the Durham Consulting, that's one of the best in the business. Um, the, but that was a very top level um, the estimate at that point. Sure. So we'll have those numbers at what point? In, in about the process? six months. So if we're starting this feasibility study, this would be about six months. So by summer, um, the, we'll have a full report on the load capacity of the piers, what the permitting path would be, environmental path, cost estimation, so forth. So with with my experience with these public-private partnerships and which gets funded by public money, surely there's a lot, I mean not surely, there is a lot invested already by the public in the bridge structure itself. So the, the $45 million is totally a private campaign? No, the city, the city has, um, out of that, um, the, the city has invested 8.35 million. Okay, so, that's what I, I didn't yeah. hear the number. Spread so out over 8. multiple 8.3 is in that capital campaign. Yes. Okay. That is correct. Um, well, congratulations for being at this point. So let me know when you're next in Chicago. I'll take you on a tour. We look forward to that greatly. <laughs> Other comments, questions? Hearing none, Mr. Katz, thank you very much. It's a very exciting thank project, you. and we look forward to, uh, to hearing more. and more from you. Thank you. With nothing else coming before us, we're adjourned and the commission will rise.